it, fuck it, fuck it. Nah, Our nah, insiders are DJ talking K. your teams. Sports 1280, New Got Orleans. Around, high boy Welcome back, Duncan Holder. Not a wobble wobble Wednesday without our man Will Guillory. Of course, covers the Pelicans for NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. And Will, uh, NBA draft is coming. And I know we spent a lot of attention on DeMarcus Cousins and Rajon Rondo when we have you on the show each week. Uh, but without a first-round pick, and this isn't the first or the second or the fifth or the maybe seemingly the 100th time where the, the Pelicans slash Hornets have not had a first-round pick, uh, what do you feel like the, the Pelican strategy is going into this draft, which is, what, uh, a couple weeks away? Right, yeah, June 22nd. And I think uh... – you know, first of all, I think I think it can kind of go one of two ways, to be honest. I think, uh, first off, you know, we've seen in the past that maybe uh, Dell Dempster's kind of been the guy to package the second-round pick with one of uh, somebody else and maybe use that to, to bring in someone else uh, to the rotation or maybe get one of his contracts off the book. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see that. And I, I think in recent history, we've also seen him – uh, use his assets to kind of move up in the draft and jump up to go get somebody that he likes in the second round. We saw him do that with Frank Jackson. He traded away Tim Frazier to acquire a second-round pick so he can trade two second-round picks to move up and go get Frank Jackson last year. And two years ago, we saw him package two first-round picks <clears throat> so he can move up and go get Chuck Diallo. So I think uh, those are two options for him. And I think with the, the contracts that they've been adding recently, it wouldn't be surprising to see Dell want to go up and, 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 you know, get one more cheap contract on the books, one more young guy that they can kind of develop without spending money on it, really knowing that they got to do out so much money for those top guys on the roster. Do they pay much attention to the prospects who are floating around in the first round, the top tier? I mean, look, I, I know just covering the NFL and the Saints for so long, I know – even though, say, the Saints might not have a high first-round pick, they still zero in and do their due diligence on quarterbacks that you never know if they fall. Do you think the Pelicans still kind of take a, a good hard look at some of those top, say, top 10 lottery picks, or do they zero in on the guys who uh, might, might be closer down to the line uh, at the end of the first round, maybe someone that might drop into the second round? Right, I don't know how much they are looking at, you know, the the Marvin Bagley's or the DeAndre Aton's. Those guys would be, you know, in the top ten picks. But I think certainly you got to look at those guys maybe later on in the first round because you never know they might end up falling to you. Uh, a good example of that is Frank Jackson. I think uh, a, a bunch of guys in the in the Pelicans front office looked at him as a guy that was a potential first round pick, but then he had the foot uh, issues that kind of uh, forced him to have a surgery and dropped him on the draft board, and they felt like they really lucked up to get him in the second round. So those type of things happen all the time where injuries or, you know, off-the-court issues and guys end up slipping in the draft and, and you end up getting them in the second round and they turn out to be steals. So I think uh, that's the kind of due diligence all GMs have to do where you look at everybody and you prepare for every scenario because you never know a guy might end up landing in your lap that you didn't expect going in. Well, that's the you know, thing too, Will, is the idea that um... – you know, we we didn't get to see it all last year. What Frank Jackson is able to do, we're hopefully obviously going to be able to see that going into this summer league. Uh, hopefully, seeing a lot of minutes out of him to at least see what the Pelicans do have in him. But with the fact that we didn't, you didn't see Frank Jackson last year. You don't know what's happening with Demarcus Cousins. You don't know what's happening with the rest of the NBA and free agency. It seems like there's almost like this holding pattern in the NBA where everybody is waiting to see who is going to be or what's going to be that first domino to fall and then from there people are going to start making decisions based on what they need to do next just simply on the fact of it just seems like there's so much out there to try to dissect if you're an nba gm or an nba you know just a total front office how would you go about looking at moving forward as an organization knowing that all these other nebulous things are out here Right. I think this has kind of become the yearly tradition now is that everybody kind of waits around for either the LeBron free agency or the Kevin Durant free agency to wrap up, and then everybody else can kind of do what they need to do once that's over because those guys are such huge dominoes and they affect everything around them. So once those guys uh, land and figure out what they're going to do, I think that you'll see the rest of the NBA kind of going to warp speed and kind of uh, you know do what they need to do to get their roster together. But I think the Pelicans are a really interesting case because – we haven't seen them been in this position in the while. Not only are they coming off a playoff burst 
and one of the most successful seasons they've had and they've had in a while. But they've got an opportunity to sign a potential superstar, all-star level player to a large contract, which we haven't really seen them do. I mean, other than Anthony Davis, a guy that they drafted, but have a guy like Demarcus Cousins, and you're a legit contender to bring him onto your roster for a long-term contract. That's something that this team hasn't done and been in a position to do. So, you know, this is a really pressure-packed offseason for them, not only for that, but the understanding that every move you make will affect the ultimate Anthony Davis contract that you're hoping to sign next summer and his potential free agency coming the summer of 2020. So this is going to be a huge summer for this uh, this Pelicans front office, figuring out what they can do to really put this roster together and put it in a position where they can contend for years to come and with the understanding that every move you make is going to affect the ultimate contract negotiations you have with Anthony Davis because that's the end-all, be-all when it comes to this franchise. They have to find a way to get Anthony Davis to sign another long-term deal so you can keep that superstar on your roster. And as long as he's around, there's a great chance to get Will Guillory, NOLA.com, the Times Picayune, covers the Pelicans. Join us right here on Dunk and Holder. Will, uh, y- we've asked you quite a few times about Melvin Frazier, of course, the former Tulane standout, and now you're looking at mock drafts, and it's not like he's just creeping into the first round. I'm seeing him as in, and some mock drafts in the teens, maybe just as low as, say, the mid-20s. Uh, and, and I know you're uh, kind of doing a deep dive uh, profile on Melvin Frazier. Uh, what, what are, what's the sense that you get about how NBA teams like him and uh, what maybe some of the reasonings you, you feel like uh, – that Melvin has gone from, say, fringe first-round pick to maybe just being hey, someone in the middle of the first round? Right. I think, first of all, it has to start with just the fact that he, he went to the combine and really just shocked a lot of people with the way not only that he tested, but the way he competed in the scrimmages against a bunch of those guys. Because, you know, obviously, when we talk about draft, you always see the obvious names that you know. You see the guys from Kansas, from Duke. It's rare you see a guy from Tulane out there. So there was a lot of question marks on, you know, how he would compete once he's on the court with some of these big-name guys, some of these guys from these big schools that have played in these. All right, maybe I think we might – yeah, might have lost. lost them, yeah, right? might have lost Will there. We'll try to get him back here in a second. But yeah, look, it's. Uh, I think the influence of Mike Dunleavy certainly has something to do with it, and uh, also when you're talking about a prospect going pro, and who would know better if a kid would be ready to jump into the NBA game than someone who is a seasoned veteran NBA former NBA coach uh, like Mike Dunleavy and. Look, Claude, he's probably one of those guys who you see him as one of those wing players, and uh, we see how valuable they are in the NBA. And, uh, Will, just to kind of expound just uh, on what he was able to do in the combine and, and kind of show off his, his skill set. Yeah, uh, I think the, the biggest thing for him was really showing off what he could do in the combine, showing off that he, he has the athleticism to really play the position at that 2-3 in the length as well. And, you know, in today's NBA, we're seeing it in the finals and in the conference finals we saw it as well. It's so valuable to have those perimeter guys that's capable of switching, defending multiple positions, and I think he's shown that he he can do that, and he has the length and athleticism to really guard those, those versatile point guards or those wings that really want to play on the perimeter and shoot threes and drive to the basket. So, uh, uh, I think he's helped him, uh, himself a lot in this process, and the, the growth he's shown from year to year. I think uh, NBA teams are really impressed with it. And you know, having a guy like Mike Dunleavy speaking up for you as well, with all the NBA experience he has, it certainly doesn't hurt either. Will your thoughts on the NBA Finals going as you expected? Uh, do you think Cleveland even has a shot in making this a series? Man, it's going to be tough. I think uh, the one thing, if you're a Cleveland fan, you can really hang your hat on is the fact that this is just the Cle- the Cavs has just been so much better at home during the playoffs for for whatever reason. Guys like uh, J.R. Smith, Kyle Korver, uh, Tristan Thompson, these guys just have an extra burst of energy when they're playing in that uh, Quick and Loans arena. So you're hoping that they can kind of uh, do that again against the Warriors in Game Three and give give that team some life. But, I mean, we all knew that this Warriors team was just so talented, and we knew that once they got to the stage that they were going to be so locked in. And we've really seen that for a minute. And uh, the game one loss was so heartbreaking because, you know, you're not going to have many opportunities against this Warriors team. So when you do, you got to take advantage. And to allow that one to slip away, man, it, it has to hurt for everybody in that organization. I blame it all on has-been Hornets. I mean, you can't rely on those guys. The Rockets yeah. did. They blew it. J.R. Smith blew it. Don't be a has-been Hornet, man. Come on. 
I'm telling you right now, I, and he forgot to mention Jamal McGlure is on the bench with the Toronto Raptors. So, I mean, all the has been horned is get him out of here. Jamal sure. McGlure is still employed? you got to be kidding me. Good no, job, he's, I think I believe he's an assistant coach or uh, works in some, some capacity with the Toronto Raptors. So oh, okay. I always see him on the bench, and it reminds me of that, that roar whenever he used to hit the shots in the in the arena for Big Cat. Uh, every time I see him, I think about that, and I laugh. I thought he was still playing. That would have been a miracle. <laughs> like him and Eldon Campbell, homie, don't play that, any of that stuff. Yeah, no, no, no. But uh telling you, just if you got a has-been horn and it's over, don't, don't even try. Except uh, – uh, well, I guess David West has, has been Hornet, and he's yeah, and he has a ring. And in fact, if you yeah. go, there was a, uh, I think someone put out a picture on Twitter that it was like it was Chris Paul, Paige Stoyakovic, David West, and somebody else, and it said four of these guys have a ring, one of these guys doesn't. Obviously, that person was Chris Paul. Oh, oh hater. that's not right. That's, that's just not, not right, right, man. Hater, of course, Clyde. Yep, Will Clyde's always got to bring it down. Poor CP3. That's what I do. Hey, hey, Will, <laughs> appreciate the time as always, and uh, look forward to the, your coverage leading up to the draft and, of course, free agency. You don't get any time off, buddy. I mean, that's that's what happens when the Pelicans actually go pretty deep in the playoffs. Yeah, man, exactly. Let's hope we, we, we can talk about some playoffs some more going into the future. It's been, it was a fun year, and now we were just prepare for this uh, NBA draft. There you go. All right, Will, appreciate it. All right, that's Will Guillory, NOLA.com, the times pick you. we got one more break. Right here on the show, as we've been yakety yak, and a couple of LSU players have flown off the draft board. We'll bring you those updates in our final segment. So come on back. Sports 1280, NOLA.com, and the iHeartRadio app. Duncan Holder. Can't keep me down by the 